All right, welcome back everybody to Old Testament Survey. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about Saul, who is the first king of Israel. Uh, but before we actually talk about the character of Saul, this might be a good time to sort of pause in the story of the Old Testament just to talk about uh, the idea of monarchy and uh, what it means to be a king who is reigning over a kingdom. Uh, because the kingdom of God becomes a very important term in the New Testament with regard to Jesus. Jesus announces that he is bringing the kingdom of God. But there's a whole Old Testament background to this idea of king and, and kingship. And when God installs Saul as the first king of Israel, it's the next step in his plan to redeem Israel and redeem the world. So let's think for a minute about this Old Testament background with regard to the monarchy and kingship and what it means for the story of God's mission to the world. Well, here you see those, those verses in the book of Judges, the, the leadership crisis, uh, these leaders of Israel that, that really weren't very good leaders in and of themselves. Uh, it says that Israel had no king. They had no king, no competent leader. And so uh, the next step in God's plan is to give Israel a king. So here we read in 1 Samuel 8, the people's request. We want a king over us so that we can be like the other nations with a king to lead us and, and go out before us. Now, this isn't a very, you know, a very, very worthy request on the part of the people. Actually, it's pretty selfish. They basically want a human king. They want a human king to give them what they want. They want a human king to sort of accomplish uh, their own goals, their own selfish goals. Uh, and so it's not a very good request. But nevertheless, God gives them a king because obviously God has a bigger plan for this idea of monarchy and kingship. So in 1 Samuel 9, Samuel anoints Saul as the first king of Israel. So what about this request for a king and this idea of monarchy? Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with monarchy or kingship. I mean, you can either be a, a good king or a bad king. Uh, just because the people's request wasn't very good, and just because Saul ends up being you know, a bad king, uh, there's nothing that doesn't make the idea of monarchy wrong. Secondly, monarchy was necessary for Israel's survival. If Israel was going to be a nation of priests to bless the world and have influence on the world uh, for God's redemptive plan, they were going to have to have a king. Uh, a king, obviously, uh, who would follow God's ways and, uh, and, and lead the people in living God's life. But of course, there's always risk with a king because a king can become prideful and selfish and go after money and sex and power uh, and therefore not accomplish God's purpose. Thirdly, what we can say about this is that God used kingship to prepare for the king of kings and the gospel. When we get to Jesus, uh, Jesus is going to announce that the kingdom of God has come to earth. And one of the reasons that the people understand exactly what Jesus is saying is because they understand kingship in the Old Testament, especially with regard to Saul and all these other Israelite kings uh, that were installed in terms of the monarchy in Israel. So here... Uh, we see a, a slide that asks the question, what is the gospel? Well, the answer might just simply be it's the coming of God's kingdom. This is Mark chapter 1. These are the very first words out of Jesus' mouth. It says, Jesus came preaching the gospel, that is the good news from God. And he says, the time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The good news that the kingdom has come, that God is king and has rescued his people, and the whole world is going to be different from now on. So what is the gospel? It's just the coming of God's kingdom. 
But there's a whole Old Testament background to this. You remember that God created a world of beauty and order and wisdom. Uh, and God is the king. And he's ruling over his good world. And, uh, and, and the kingdom of God in creation meant that the world was a place of peace and productivity and, and blessing and community and living according to God's definition of good. It was, a, it was a perfect place. And it's a story about kingdom because God wants to share ownership of this world with the humans. And so God creates the humans in his image. He blessed them. He said, be fruitful, increase, and fill the earth, and rule over it. Rule over it. That's kingdom language. God wants the humans to rule the earth on his behalf. Well, as you know, that doesn't go very well. And the, and, uh, and, uh, the humans fall to the temptation of Satan. And Satan comes along and begins an alternative kingdom. And Satan sort of installs uh, his own kings, his own rulers who, who rule in his image uh, and define uh, you know, good and bad in the way that they want to. And so there's a hostile takeover of God's kingdom in this world. But as we know and have heard in the story, God has a plan to reassert his kingdom and his rule and uh, the blessing of that original creation. And so he has the one man and the one family, Abraham, who will bless the world. A sort of a, a community in contrast to the community of Satan. And God's promise to Abraham, he's going he's to bless the world. He's going he's to be the father of many nations. And then this kingdom language. God says to Abraham, kings will come from you. There's a promise that from that family of Abraham, a new king will come uh, to rescue God's people and to rule in his name. But then Abraham's family, the people of Israel, end up in slavery to one of the kingdoms of this world the kingdom of Egypt, and the evil ruling king Pharaoh. And so uh, Pharaoh and Egypt are set up as kind of a contrast kingdom to the kingdom of God. But God reasserts his rule and his power and his kingdom, and he rescues the people of Israel with Moses and through the Red Sea, and he, he brings them to the promised land. It's a, it's a conflict of kingdoms. And when the Israelites get across that Red Sea, they sing this song of praise. For God is highly exalted. He has thrown horse and driver into the sea. And, and then in verse 18 of Exodus 15, the people sing, The Lord reigns forever and ever. The kingdom of God gets reasserted in his rescue of the people from Egypt. And then in Exodus 19, uh, God wants the nation of Israel to partner with him again in this ownership of the world and influencing the world for good. And so, as you know, he calls the people of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. Well, there's kingdom language again. And God wants the people of Israel to partner with him in his rule of the world and blessing the world. But the problem is, is that the people of Israel are human beings too, and they're infected with the problem of sin. And so they give in to the kingdom of Satan. And uh, the book of Judges shows how, how these leaders of Israel just weren't very good leaders and godly leaders. Although they did rescue the people with God's help, they just weren't the leaders that God was looking for. And so God installs kings in Israel. We're going to talk about Saul in just a minute and, and David and, and all the other kings. Uh, to make the long story short, all of these kings of Israel, most all of them, give in to the kingdom of Satan. And these kings drive the family of God's people right into the ground. God rescues his people to live under his reign. But the people of Israel don't want to do that. They don't want to live under God's reign. To get ahead of the story just a little bit, 
There's a prophecy from the book of Isaiah looking ahead to that kingdom that God will bring in Jesus. He says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, the gospel, who proclaim peace or shalom, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. There's coming a king, says Isaiah, who's going to bring good news and announce the reign of God. Isaiah goes on in that text to say the Lord is going to return to Zion. He's going to return to Jerusalem and all the ends of the earth are going to see the salvation of our God. Of course, this prophecy ends up being fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is that coming king, who does bring the kingdom of God, returns to Jerusalem and rescues God's people and reasserts God's kingdom. Now, that's just a really quick overview of kingdom language in the Old Testament. If you want to read more about this, I recommend these two books here, both by N.T. Wright. The first one is simply Jesus, uh, and, the, and the second one is how God became king. And uh, you can read about there in those books about how Jesus announces the kingdom of God and fulfills uh, that kingdom, those kingdom prophecies from the Old Testament. To fast forward all the way to the end of the story in the book of Revelation, here we see Revelation chapter 1, which talks about Jesus, who is the ruler of the kings of the earth. You remember in Jesus' Lord's Prayer, uh, the first phrase, Jesus prays, your kingdom come, your will be done. So Jesus teaches us to pray for that kingdom of God uh, to come ever more fully, uh, in the, in, uh, as God reigns over the humans and over the world. Here's Revelation 11, again, announcing the end of the, of the story, that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. That's how it's going to end. Satan's kingdom will be defeated, and God will reassert his kingdom and his reign over all the earth. So, what is the gospel? That's the question we asked. And, and how does it relate to king and monarchy and, and all of that? This is a quote from N.T. Wright. He says that the gospel is the coming of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ and the implementation of the range of God's effective will reigning over every area of human life, bringing peace and safety and community and productivity and blessing. That's what went wrong at the beginning in creation. And God is going to rescue his people by bringing a king to reign over the kingdom of this world and to defeat it and to reinstall his values and reign over all the earth. So let's talk for just a minute about the character of Saul. Because when God installs Saul as the first king and begins this institution of monarchy in Israel, it's the next step in the story of God's mission to the world. So what kind of king will Saul be? Well, he, as we already mentioned, he's anointed by Samuel, and Saul appears from the outside to be a, a great king. He's handsome, he's, he's from a good family, He's taller than anyone else, and it just looks like Saul's going to succeed and, uh, and be exactly the kind of king that God wants him to be. So he's anointed by Samuel, he's even selected by God, and he's publicly acclaimed as king. What could go wrong? Well, things go terribly wrong for Saul because he becomes prideful and selfish, and he becomes basically a king in the human mold. And he is influenced more by Satan and the kingdom of Satan than the kingdom of God. Uh, you can read these three stories for yourself in the book of 1 Samuel. And it just shows uh, Saul's disobedience and failure to live up to God's ideal of being a king. Now, here's a particularly uh, egregious failure. Uh, Paul or Saul names his son... Ish Baal. Ish Baal uh, is the Hebrew word for man of Baal. So it just shows that 
Saul himself has become a worshiper of Baal. Uh, and he's not at all following God's values, and he's not at all leading the people uh, in living up to God's law and God's And so almost immediately, uh, Saul is going to have the kingdom torn away from him. And in 1 Samuel 16, we read that the spirit of the Lord comes upon David, but an evil spirit comes on Saul. And so there's going to be sort of a sort of just a switch now. Uh, Saul is going to descend uh, into failure and defeat and ultimately death. And David, God's next installed king, is going to rise to power. The problem is, is that Saul looked like a king, but his heart wasn't right before God. David did not look like a king, but his heart followed the Lord, especially in terms of humility and leading God's people to live God's kind of life. It's interesting that uh, when the kings of Israel come on the scene, Saul, the first king, is a bad king. David, the second king, is a good king. And maybe that's intentional because when you experience a bad king like Saul and his failure, then I think you want even more for a good king to come along and, and, and to be that godly kind of king and bring about God's redemption. So I think it's intentional that God gives Israel a bad king first and a good king second. And so Saul becomes jealous of David because he can see that David is gaining in popularity and is going to be the next king. And, and so you can read these stories for yourself about Saul's jealousy. It even tries to kill David on several occasions, and he chases him down in the desert, but God protects David. Finally, Saul is in, is in such a predicament that that he, he goes to this witch of Endor, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this witch ends up predicting Saul's death, and Saul commits suicide on Mount Gilboa. What a sad end to a very promising beginning, but that's because Saul was not the king that God was looking for. So king and kingship are very important now in the story of Israel because it will lead ultimately to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, and the good news that he will rescue God's people finally and forever.